dialed Waiting. into the session, yeah. But we'll wait for, uh, wait a minute. Your stream has ended, it says. Go live now, yes, go live. live. Uh, let's see what happens. Okay, we're live now. But I don't awesome. see any people attending, which is fine. Which is so we're we're expecting one or two people, uh, but you know we've got uh, only forty five minutes. So what I want to do is maybe at least uh, for the time we have, just three of us, maybe we we'll do a quick round of introductions, and then other people can introduce themselves. You know, as uh, if and when they join. Uh, but why don't we? Start with you, Stephen, and then Kareem, and then, uh, you know, I, I sent around an introduction uh, uh, of my background, so I don't need to spend much time on that. So why don't you go ahead, Stephen, and then Kareem. Sure thing. Uh, my name is Stephen Forte. I'm a, um, I'm a managing partner at Fresco Capital, which is a seed and Series A stage uh, VC fund uh, based in the Bay Area. I also have... Um, but we also have an office in Singapore, where my other, where the other managing partner is located, and we invest, as I said, in like early and C stage companies, um, pretty globally. I mean, about half our companies are here in the Bay Area, and another maybe a quarter are in the New York region. Uh, but then we actually really do have a lot, like in we have some in Estonia and, and India and some other places. Uh, so we do invest pretty globally. And um, you know, my background before being a venture capitalist is. Um, I'm actually, um, I come from the entrepreneur side, you know, I, I'm, I'm still not sure that's the right move. Like we, we celebrate entrepreneurs turn VCs. Uh, I, I kind of viewed like, um, famous athletes turn sports broadcast announcers, you know, like only the really good ones at both make good, you know, being a great, you know, hitter doesn't make you in baseball, doesn't necessarily make you a great uh, commentator. So, um, I had to unlearn a lot of things, uh, to become a VC for a successful entrepreneur. I, I did actually five different venture backed companies um, over about 20 something years before I went into the VC side. All, and all five of those went through MA. So at least I'm good at giving advice, um, you know, towards the end and, you know, building the teams and things like that. So I'll, I'll end it there and we can kind of um, move on for the next one. Sure. Good, Karim. Thank you. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to follow that, Stephen, but. Um... <laughs> Sounds way more impressive than it is. Trust yeah. me. <laughs> um, uh, it's just uh, it's just the three of us. So no, I started way back when, many 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 year ago, many years ago, angel investing in various uh, startup companies. I've always been an entrepreneur at heart. Uh, formed, created, run uh, my own businesses from the time that I was in Kenya. That's where I was born in Kenya. Moved to the U.S. in two thousand and moved to the Bay Area in 2013. And along the way, have seen uh, like all other investors success and failures and chalking up the failures more than the successes uh, to the stage. But, um, you know, there's always that 10% that's successful and that's the company I'm with now, which is linked to, uh, which is interesting. We uh, invested in this company in 2016 and we were building the back end plumbing for regional banks and FIs and in credit unions so that they could compete with uh, the big five banks in the U.S. Uh, successfully generating revenue, but it was never going to be a, a, an exit company or a unicorn company because the growth was very, very slow given the restrictions in, uh, in that environment. So we retooled the business and uh, we then created a financial marketplace uh, with the, with the idea of um, creating liquidity in a very illiquid market, so acorns to unicorns in the private sector. Uh, we did that two years ago, and since then, uh, it's just taken off. Uh, we were in the right place, the right, the right time, with the right product, with the right team, and um, we got a little bit of uh, sprinkly angel dust on us, and we've exploded. Uh, the, uh, the time was ripe for us to start... Uh, with the, se the secondary shares of unicorn companies, and we haven't looked back. We took off all the acorn companies, and now we're creating liquidity with the unicorn companies and uh, allowing um, accredited investors to uh, invest with us on the, uh, on the secondary, uh, secondary market. It's interesting because what has happened is we are on the cap table of all the companies that we invest in. We are investors in these companies. 
uh, Coinbase, SoFi, just Impossible Foods, Carbon, ThoughtSpot, and various ones that you'll see on the link to uh, on the link to site. So we are actually investors in these companies. We then create SPV LLCs for the accredited investors to join us. And at a time of liquidity, you know, they can choose whether they want it in kind or in cash. And we've been uh, quite successful in that market. So still creating liquidity in a very illiquid market. This is, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg today. Uh, and we're creating further liquidity uh, with an ATS uh, this year. So, um, you know, given the market conditions, we'll continue to do that uh, successfully, I think, uh, moving forward. Well, thank you. I think both are uh, very impressive and interesting backgrounds. And, uh, uh, you know, just to maybe add a couple of uh, uh, yeah, you know, relevant points from my side. Uh, I kind of, inter- you know, of course, I had very different uh, career path at the IFC, where, uh, you know, much broader, touching all kinds of different things, uh, as, I, as you would expect in an organization like that over, you know, last 28, 29 years. Uh, but then I stepped down. But then it did involve uh, a bit of angel investing in the emerging markets from the IFC side. And, uh, uh, that that continues. So I am uh, an advisor to uh, the in-house VC uh, company of Standard Chartered Bank out of Singapore. It's called SC Ventures. And uh, they have uh, somebody in the uh, Bay Area as well, uh, really to find, uh, you know, uh, opportunities uh, that, that have, uh, you know, bearing on what they're trying to do. Uh, I'm also on the board of uh, and on the advisory council of an uh, interesting firm that is uh, really a structured credit vehicle to refinance fintechs. So uh, people like uh, Sophie in emerging markets uh, who have found a solution uh, to essentially disintermediate the banks or create value in in the secondary lending market, as Sophie has done, but to refinance their portfolios because, you know, VC money is not a good uh, <clears throat> good way to finance uh, portfolio lending assets. So the uh, so, so that business is uh, also teaching me a lot of interesting things about uh, these uh, startup companies going into the banking uh, business and uh, is is fairly fairly interesting. I do a num- a little bit of uh, at uh, fintech work also in the insurance sector in my role at Mastercard, where I advise them on uh, specifically on uh, getting Mastercard capabilities into the insurance industry. As you know, it's the card business is more uh, embedded, uh, almost exclusively embedded in the banking world as opposed to the insurance world, but the insurance world, I think, is uh, probably more uh, in need of that type of uh, digitization in their processes and and what they do, uh, and in terms of their uh, delivery to the last mile. And so that's uh, that's also brings me a little bit to the tech sector, uh, you know, in addition to the other stuff that I'm doing. So so that's, uh, uh, that's what I think makes for, I think, quite a few uh, interesting commonalities between uh, the three of us. Uh, Excuse me. Uh, Sure, what happened here? Uh, So, uh, you know, it seems to me that, and this is not unusual with these uh, process meetings that we have uh, people who have confirmed and then do not join. So I suspect uh, we are now at around 6.40, 10 minutes into the session. And I suspect we may not have any more attendees. So maybe, you know, what we should do is uh, uh, have a conversation, I guess, just among the three of us uh, in the in the time we have available. If somebody joins, you know, so be it. So, you know, I'd sent around, uh, you know, a couple of questions that I thought, uh, you know, would be interesting topics to talk about from your, your individual perspectives. Uh, both are very rich uh, uh, and well-informed perspectives on uh, on on the investment management business, and uh, so you know one of the thing now as a maybe Stephen uh, starting with you, mm-hmm. you know could you maybe uh, you know tell us a little bit more about the kind of span of your current VC ro- investing role, 
in terms of types of companies and uh, you know types of uh, businesses you're pursuing both in the portfolio and potentially in the pipeline and then uh, you know uh, give us a little flavor on uh, uh, what uh, what have the last two years uh, you know this kind of event done to kind of your lps in terms of their uh, their their perspective on what this want to see you do and if there's been any change uh, and are they looking for of course you know thankfully you know uh, in the case of uh, you know technology uh, there has been not you know there has been a lot of opportunities in addition to you know the the uh, the pushback on on some aspects of the businesses depending what business you're in so so the uh, so it will also be interesting to learn uh, sort of which side of the equation are are the lps uh, you know uh, leaning towards are they leaning towards more saying look this is a fabulous opportunity this is an inflection point uh, that puts you know these types of certain types of tech sort of opportunities on a different plane and a different uh, you know trajectory and let's go for it or are they saying look this uncertainty is way too much uh, already we see businesses you know uh, you know fairly risky and uh, the sort of ratio of unicorns to failures is uh, is uh, you know uh, is is not that attractive anymore because of all these changes so get uh, it'll be good to get an understanding of what you're hearing from the market on on these two aspects yeah it's um it's it's actually a really interesting thing to think about because we all talk about what tech has done for VCs with their investments. And like, you know, I think even on a former Horas panel, I, we, I was on one of those, like, you know, our digital health are doing, you know, we were talking about that, but we, but no one's actually asked the question about like limited partners. And it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I also have insight into that because, um, you know, we co-invest with um, large VCs all the time. Right. You know, so I hear what they're saying, right. You know, so it, it, it's been pretty uniform. It's a combination of two things. The, the first is, and, and this one is less COVID driven than anything else, right? But the, the limited partners are definitely still um, bullish on tech, right? And because the, you know, private markets are always going to be, you know, a reflection to some degree of the public markets, right? But more importantly, affected by the monetary policy, right? So if the traditionally super, super low interest rates, you know, pretty much zero, um, super, super loose monetary policy um, for, you know, I'll make the argument for almost 20 years, right? Like, I mean, and every crisis that we've had, right, has been a deflationary crisis, right? Like we've had, you know, like, you know, people, I guess the three of us are probably old enough to remember some of the inflationary crises, but most people are not. And I always joke, I said, your average age, of a, of a trader, of a bond trader at Goldman Sachs on the desk, right, was in high school when the last interest rate hike, when the serious last, when we had, a, you know, interest rate. So, like, you know, they didn't even know what to do, right? So, so in essence, that's filtering over to the limited partners. So, so they're, and what's good and bad is that the limited partners are putting way more capital into the alternative asset class. Um, and then, of course, expecting the returns. Uh, the, the problem that we're seeing and is that every fund is just raising bigger and bigger funds and coming back to their limited partners faster and faster. And the limited partners are getting exhausted because we are we have broken your traditional two to three year kind of cycle going back to market to go to funds. And you have folks like Tiger and Andreessen and Horowitz, like every time you you pop onto TechCrunch or the information or any of those sites, you're seeing them raise another multi-billion dollar fund, right? Like I just read this morning, Founders Fund just raised 5 billion, you know, like, um, so in essence, the limited partners are, are getting stretched. And some of the ones that I'm talking to that are newer, um, and, you know, as we're going through our fund, they're like, it's February. I talked to a guy on Monday and he goes, it's February 28th and I'm filled up for the year. And he goes, I never thought this would, if you would have asked me in November, I wouldn't have said that. But all my, all my managers came back. Um, so that's been interesting. I think that's going to change drastically as, you know, as Chairman Powell starts ratcheting up the rates and things like that. Um, the second half of your question was like, what are their expectations? You know, ultimately what the limited partners have been looking for um, in this kind of COVID environment is, you know, what are the things that are going to survive or thrive in the post, you know, survive through COVID and thrive and, you know, survive through COVID and then thrive post COVID. 
Uh, so, you know, very excited about things, technology that's getting pulled forward from, you know, specifically with like the COVID environment, right? So, um, you know, digital health has been, you know, pretty hot as you would expect, right? Um, as well as future of work, as you would expect, right? Um, but also just like things you wouldn't necessarily expect that are, are pretty interesting too, like, like insurance tech and things like that. So we're seeing a, you know, kind of like a pull forward effect. And I think the best analogy that people can relate to if you're not really a, a VC geek, right, is, um, is Netflix, right? And if you look at Netflix two years ago, what everyone who was smart argument that they made when Netflix earnings went through the roof, you know, just about two years ago, was that Netflix was not getting new customers, so to speak, but they were pulling forward the next two or three years worth of customers all in one lump, like Disney with Disney plus, it was like a very similar scenario, right? The Peloton, all, all similar stories was like, they were, they were just getting all this growth. And, and then that, you know, zoom, like all the others, right. We're doing it. So we're, um, you know, we're looking at then the, the folks that are, um, you know, kind of pulled forward, but haven't pulled forward all that growth yet. You know, thank you, Stephen. I think that that's very illuminating. I mean, uh, I'll come back with a couple of follow-ups on that. Uh, but let me uh, give the floor to Kareem here uh, on his thoughts on these on these points that we discussed. Yeah, it's really an interesting phenomenon, actually. Uh, as we scour the globe for emerging companies and trends, <clears throat> for the last two years, even before COVID happened, we were uh, conducting this this conference, we call it the Global Investor Conference, whereby we start very early in the morning at eight o'clock and we get speakers, entrepreneurs and thought leaders in Europe at eight o'clock in the morning. And then we come to the States mid morning. Uh, then we go to Australia early afternoon and then to Asia early in the evening. And so in 10 hours, we get to get the perspective of what's happening globally, what our investors investing in. What are entrepreneurs building and what are thought leaders thinking about the next thing that's happening? So we started talking about blockchain for impact. We started talking about NFTs, started talking about space technologies, the metaverse, before they became popular words in today's vernacular. And, and then COVID came um, and, and, and hit us in, um, in 2019. And we continued with the online, uh, the Global Investor Conference, and we started to get a lot of feedback about what investors were doing and entrepreneurs were building. And we started to see a shift in what was happening with global environments and what was being invested in. And all of a sudden, you started to see, or and Stephen and, and both of you will know that originally when you were an investor prior to this time, you sort of either were global or limited yourself to a country or even to an area where you could meet the founders and know what they were doing. In this environment, post-COVID or pre during and, and post-COVID, we've seen an explosion of investable opportunities in environments that were not possible uh, without even meeting physically uh, with the founders. You got better at uh, understanding what they were building and why they were building it. And what it was really interesting is, as opposed to the US or Europe, where a lot of builders are building companies that focus on a very small demographic, uh, as opposed to India, Asia, and South America, where they, they're building for the masses, all of a sudden you start to see a mind shift on how you can actually invest in companies that are addressing 80% of the market rather than 20% of the market, right? So, which, though, and we started to see a lot of investments that, I mean, before NFTs were even popular in the US, I mean, in Asia, there was a lot of NFT investments happening in Asia in 2019, um, and it's only becoming popular here now. Uh, so as I see this trend, of how to converse with entrepreneurs and what investors are willing to do. We're stepping out of boundaries that we were not familiar with. And then secondly, we're looking at the new kind of companies that are being built, you know, whether it's Web 3.0 or the metaverse and a lot of activity going there and especially with the advent and adoption of blockchain as well as crypto um, 
uh, cryptocurrencies. There's a lot of activity, in, and pre and, and pre this meltdown in uh, the last year of the SaaS companies or the regular FANG companies, where you see a, a real depreciation in technologies, where there's a lot of interest of pre IPO companies in that. Uh, folks now are moving towards more of uh, a, a new era, a new dimension of investable opportunities, which is quite interesting. Uh, and I think, I, I don't think we've actually seen the the um, the extent to which COVID has changed what is being built. You know. Take supply chain logistics, take uh, blockchain, take smart payments, take uh, P2P, take um, sovereign identity. All of these things are starting to permeate more and more into everyday life that we wouldn't have paid attention to pre-COVID. Uh, and now we're paying a lot of attention to it. Um, that would be my pre-post-COVID uh, environment. The other interesting point will be to see actually what's happening, what this current situation with Ukraine and Russia creates. Uh, Doing some feedback on that, I mean, we're starting to look at the payment environments change because of that. We're looking at swift change and we're looking at the technologies that affect payment change. Um, You know, will defense stocks start to rise? Will robotics start to rise? Will uh, sovereign identity start to rise more and more? A lot of changes. So I think we're moving away from traditional SaaS products to more um, more interesting web technologies that are developing. That would be my perspective. Thanks, Karim. You know these are uh, you know very 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 interesting insights. We could have much longer conversations around this, but uh, we have less than twenty minutes left. So I do want to ask the other question, which kind of goes to some of the remarks already Karim has made. Around the experience around, uh, you know, management teams, founders, entrepreneurs, on how, you know, we always had this, uh, every investor around the world, uh, whether, uh, you know, VC or or private equity or even listed companies, in the end, uh, you know, all of us agree, I think that, you know, a a venture is as good as its management. And uh, so, but, you know, this, these last two years in particular have been a very interesting, I would say, stress test uh, for management uh, for a lot of ventures around the world, uh, given the fact that uh, there has been certainly an elevated level of uncertainty, both in terms of the business environment, how you deal with staff, how you deal with, uh, you know, uh, social issues around uh, a health situation uh, for the general public, for yourself. And, and for your teams and for your customers and the like. So well, what would be very interesting to learn from you, Stephen and Karim, is, uh, you know, what has been your experience? Have, been, have you seen, uh, you know, a, a differential uh, in performance across your portfolios, across the companies you observe, in how people have uh, adjusted to this more challenging environment of, of COVID in terms of... Uh, both uh, managing existing businesses, uh, expanding them, you know, according to plan or adjusting uh, their plans in in the light of what's happened, and uh, you know, creating new opportunities around these these challenges. So, you know, what and you know, because I think there was another question embedded there in my note earlier, but I think you all have already answered that in terms of you know which businesses you know have have shown more promise and resilience. Uh, you know, you you named a few. I could name another, including payments, which whichever I'm involved with, with Mastercard and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, on the management, I think it'll be it's a very interesting topic. I think to all investors, uh, uh, that you know how how what has been the observation of uh, uh, you know VCs and other investors who follow these uh, companies very closely uh, for good reason. Uh, what differentiation? What differentiation have you seen over these over these last couple of years, and what do you see that as a as an indicator for the future in terms of guidance for investors? You know? uh, I mean, that, that's a great question because it's something that the last piece of it is obvious. It's not just it's it's not like COVID is the only challenge that a startup faces when you make an investment. So, like in five years from now, even if the world is 
normal, <laughs> right? there's going to be challenges that they're going to face. They just won't be as um, systemic as, let's say, like in global and, and, and quite frankly, uniform as COVID. The interesting thing about COVID, just as an aside, is we're all facing it together, right? So it's, you know, when people say, oh, my kids are home from school and they're losing, but like all the kids are home. Right. You know, so like it's something that's happening globally. Right. So we're going to go through this, this trauma together. So back to your question is, is um, it's actually the founders that have been successful have been the ones that have had the ability to adapt. Right. So that's a very generic answer, but it's also the most succinct answer because it's truly the one characteristic across, you know, in the 60 odd companies that are active in the portfolio pre COVID, we've only had one that went out of business in the past two years, right? And it probably would have went out of business without COVID, but it just went out of business probably a little faster in this two-year period. On the contrast, we've also had a tremendous amount of successes during COVID. We've had a couple of big exits. We've had a lot of subsequent rounds and a lot of growth. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, before I pass the mic over, as I'll give a quick example or two, is like we had two companies um, and I've got like five or 10 like this, but what was in digital health and what was in education technology? And they both had to, of course, they, they were like, I hate to use the term right place at the right time, but their solutions were definitely solutions to the problem. But they also were like seed level companies, right? So they didn't have a huge staff. They had maybe 10 to 20 people on staff or, you know, one of them, well, one of them had about 30 people on staff. So their solutions, their infrastructure wasn't ready to deal with the, you know, 10x level growth of volume and revenues, you know, that came along with it, right? You know, so we, you know, just one of the companies, and, and there were some side effects, like one company was providing a free tier and a non, and then a paid tier, and but their AWS bills went through the roof because the free tier was, you know, every school in the country was using it because it was a great solution for remote school, right? So um, the ability to deal with that um, is truly, you know, what was interesting, you know, building, you know, the proverbial example of jumping off the building and building the airplane as you're falling. I mean, that is exactly what they truly were doing. Um, so the founders and the management team around those founders that had that ability to adapt and it's okay. Like as a board member and investor, they call me up and they're almost crying because it's so hard. Like that's okay. Cause that's what we're here for as investors. Like we give them the support. And then once they vent, to then point them in the right direction, but then to watch them as soon as they hang up the phone to go charge and then actually, you know, you know, grab the bull by the proverbial horns. Those, those are the ones that um, have been successful during COVID and then will continue to be successful post COVID. Because if, if you can look at a silver lining, so to speak, is that now investors are looking at this trait where I feel like a lot of companies the founders were very pre COVID were very set in their ways. Like I'm going to build a blue bottle, right? Even if the market doesn't want a blue bottle, you're going to build the blue bottle and blow through 5 million of venture capital to go build that blue bottle. Um, now VCs are like, well, what happens if the market wants like, you know, a, a green tube instead of a blue bottle. <laughs> right? Um, and, and that's actually is, is definitely part of the diligence process. If I if I could pick up on Steve's last point, I agree with everything else he said. The ability to uh, to manage during crisis is an important thing. Um, so I won't repeat any of all of that. But what I do need to pay attention to, and I think uh, you will agree with this, is actually as a growth company, you have to start paying attention to the management itself, because ordinarily the guy who starts the startup company may be able to take it to 50 million or 20 million worth of revenue, but the transition between those numbers to a hundred million dollar company to $300 million company, that is changing rapidly. And I think people will start to start to realize that it's not the same team that does this and they need to either the management team from this founder down needs to understand that there's going to be a change in the whole corporate culture as the companies expand quickly or rapidly because of the industry that they're in. Um, in terms of explosive growth and dealing with virtual uh, employees, it's, it's not easy. Uh, but there are efficiencies in that environment that we have to pay attention to. And what we start to see is you have to make decisions quickly. If you cannot see the person physically every day, it's like, okay, what are the KPIs and how do you manage to those KPIs? 
and you make decisions very quickly in either to employ as well as transition out employees who are not meeting those KPIs very quickly. So I think it's become a little bit more, hey, we're doing this. And if you're on board, you're on board. If you're not, you have to exit. Um, so I think the decision points are becoming closer together than rather than test, test, test for three to six, nine, 12 months or whatever the case is. So I, that's what I see happen. But, but I mean, by the same token, though, I'll tell you as a personal example, I mean, the ability, the, the whole COVID thing was a global thing. And it allowed us to experiment and explore with global employees and the talent and capabilities that you find are pretty good if you're not limiting yourself geographically. Yeah, and one of our, just on that quick point, one of our companies, um, which was starting to go full remote even before COVID, um, what they said is during COVID, because I can't say post-COVID because we're not quite there yet. We're getting close, thankfully, but we're not quite there. So during COVID, um, the founder told me probably about a year ago, he said, you know, I'm able to hire a higher quality person remote now because a lot of people were unwilling to work remote in, before COVID that were higher quality candidates than, the, you know, than, than we would normally attract. Right. So he felt that like the, the pool of applicants is, is increased by, you know, not just from a geographical perspective, right? because he actually was limited his hiring mostly to the U.S. Right. So he wasn't exploring, you know, um, remote employees abroad. But because more candidates were now working remotely, um, he had a larger pool to pull from, right? You know, then obviously that expands if you just, you know, obviously if you cast your net wider than the United States. His particular case, it made sense. But, you know, most companies in our portfolio pretty much don't care anymore where, where they hire. Um, with the caveat that that can't last forever either, right? Like it, it, there, there'll be a balance where you're going to have, you can't have the 100%, you know, we, we're trying to be 100% centralized. You also can't be 100% decentralized. So I'm curious... And I'm, I'm happy to speak on future panels about it as to see how they evolved over the next decade, right? Like, you know, as we went from, you know, over, you know, it took us 48 hours to pivot into completely decentralized remote, right? And it's going to take us, you know, maybe four years, you know, to kind of figure out what that looks like. Right? No, thanks. No, I think this, this is a, a certainly an evolving situation and we, we haven't, we haven't seen the end of it yet by any means, but, uh, but in amongst your portfolio companies, Stephen, are you seeing, uh, you know, a group of companies or a group of managements that are doing this better than others? Or you feel that everybody is kind of moving more or less, uh, you know, with the same level of adaptability? Oh, no, we're definitely seeing a, um, you know, like tiered response, right? You know, from, you know luckily for us, um, a good chunk of our companies already had a fair amount of remote exposure before or remote experience right before the, the pandemic. But even, even with that, there are definitely companies that are either handling that better. Like, you know, one of the companies before COVID had a remote team and they had, I mean, this was dated a little bit, but they had like a Skype window open on a, on a TV with a webcam that just showed the other, you know, it was like, it was basically like two offices. One was in San Francisco, one was somewhere else. I forget where it was, but they had, you know, even though nothing was going on, they just had that Skype window open all, you know, eight, nine hours a day. Just, you know, people could wave, you know, just see what other people are doing or look and then hop on a call and in a different room. Just as, you know, I'm not saying that's a good or bad. I'm just saying we've already had companies that were experimenting with remote employees pre-COVID, particularly because being seed in Series A, they couldn't afford the Bay Area prices to, to pay for engineers and product designers and things like that. So they were already starting to kind of um, think about the remote. Um, so I'm going to say that the ones that had that head start have definitely, on average, performed better, right? Because it wasn't as much of a shock for them. Okay. Uh, Karim, you, among the companies that you're seeing, are you seeing any kind of differentiation in terms of their ability to adapt to the environment? And is it kind of reflected in some way in the price uh, of the, you know, the valuations that uh, you, you track as a, uh, you know, as a daily core for your, for, for your fund. Uh, so in other words, what I'm asking is that is, is the ability to react to this or adapt to these changing circumstances over the last two years, is the, has there been a factor in observed performance of the portfolio? And are you able to make out any kind of trends, uh, you know, in that, including in, you know, relatively mature companies like SoFi, for example. Uh, you know, are you seeing... Uh, 
Are you seeing the ability to attract? Of course, you know, there are multiple factors, including the business model and how that is impacted or not impacted. But every business model is impacted in some way. And it will be interesting for investors to uh, understand, uh, you know, get your insights on, uh, you know, what type of companies uh, are adapting better and and the ones uh, who are adapting, are they being rewarded by the market? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. So it goes back to what Stephen said a little bit is we, uh, our company, we were decided very quickly, I think it was April of 2019, so we're just going to go completely remote. Um, and we went through our teething problems and challenges about how to uh, identify employees that could work well, how to measure their productivity, what was the outcome uh, that we had internally. And so we learned a lot very, very quickly, and we applied the same models to companies that we're looking at, right? How are they addressing new hires? How are they addressing new markets? Because we have global investors now and global employees, and the mindset of the, the, the trends you look at, the trends of employees on how you're going to hire them and where, if you're restrictive as a company on saying, okay, I'm only going to do this, it reflects the mindset of the, uh, the founders and the team. And if, you, if the reflection of that dynamic is not global in nature, then you have to worry about the success of that company. So you look at what policies they have in place and whether they've adapted well enough to the environment. Now, the global pandemic was a global situation where everyone was thrown into the same situation at the same time. But there will be events future on that may not be global, but it still affects how, going back to the original point, was how do founders react to these environments? And that's the key of it, right? And um, to measure those uh, those uh, effective decisions is something we pay attention to. Yeah, but not to put you in too much of a spot, but you know, as a moderator, I need to put you on a little yeah. bit of a spot. Yeah. So, but can you give me some examples of, uh, in, from what you've seen in companies that have done that better, and some that have not done as well in the last couple of years. Yeah, uh, for example, we we were interviewing a company in Southeast Asia. And they, you know, they, before the pandemic, they, had, they were funded very heavily from both the U.S., uh, Europe, as well as Asia. Uh, and they had um, 150 employees. During the COVID time, they expanded to 800 employees and continued to raise funds because they, the, the founders were young, they were aggressive. What they did find was that their business model, because of the restrictions, they no longer restricted their business model locally because they were a P2P business for small, medium-sized businesses, a payment infrastructure for small, medium-sized businesses in a particular region in Asia. With COVID, they realized that they couldn't hold themselves within that box and they expanded very quickly and they got even more funding and raised even more employees. And had more employees. And so they expanded very quickly. That was a reflection on the management team and how they adopted to it. Uh, you have other companies that couldn't convert from that blue bottle to the blue to the green tube. <laughs> right. They just couldn't do it. Uh, because they, just couldn't of, do it. Yeah. they just couldn't do it. And those failed, right? Or are failing and will fail. Or, or were smart and knew they had to get to the green too, but what, didn't hustle and raise the VC or pivot the team fast enough, right? Like I've seen that too on the margins. And that's, that's actually typical of companies that have pitched us, luckily. Like luckily our portfolio didn't really contain many companies that did that. But we've seen companies that were pitching us after they've already kind of missed that window. And then like are pitching us about the window. Like, you should have been pitching me. I, I, I was point blank. Like you should have pitched me a year and a half ago. Like where were you in like July of 2020 or September of 2020? Like don't be pitching me at the end of 2021 on this, you know, on this opportunity. But, yeah. You know, yeah, that's one lesson I've learned over the years as an investor is I haven't seen a business plan that has panned out uh, the way it was written. Uh, you know, three years, never. Years, never. never. Not one, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, you, know, I mean, you know, and the simple explanation is that uh, there is no equation for the future, right? The math can solve only four variables. <laughs> you know, we have got a few hundred we are working with. 
and, and those variables change over time. So the ability to manage uncertainty is the, you know, I, for me, the number one, uh, number one uh, sort of uh, factor in success versus failure other than d- dumb old good luck. Uh, but, <laughs> but that aside, uh, but, you know, before we close, I can't, uh, you know, I guess have a complete session without talking about Ukraine and this situation, because I think we are looking at, uh, at least for the next few years. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but, uh, you know, the fact is that this, you know, is another unfortunate reset of the world geopolitical equation uh, in many ways. Uh, we were hoping and uh, Europe was hoping things were going in one direction, but, you know, this this sudden reversal, uh, I hope uh, it changes. But what are the investors saying? You know, you're saying people are coming back to the LPs with, you know, whole tons and tons of new funds. They've been obliging so far, but you know, is that attitude going to change now that uh, the new geopolitical reality is hitting home, uh, and uh, investors really have to take into account? So, what's your what's your, what's going to happen on the LP front with all this? I mean, I, I think if I, I think a bigger shock to the system was the, the geopolitical mood of a combination because I view them as similar events. I view that Brexit and the election of Donald Trump were more of a shock to the geopolitical system than um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, right? Because it's just a higher intensity version of what they've been doing for the last five or six years, or if you go back to 2008. Um, you know, so ultimately, I feel that the limited partners are going to be concerned about sanctions, um, particularly. They're going to be concerned about the flow of money and the flow of supply chain issues because Ukraine is a very important country when it comes to supply chain, particularly in you know semiconductors and things like that. Um, but ultimately, is as unfortunate as the, the situation is, and like you, I feel like it's it's probably going to last a long time unfortunately like i you know there's there's a lot of geopolitical reasons why russia is doing what it's doing i disagree with them all of course but i i don't see them stopping unless they're made to stop and that's that's a very long um, proposition so i do think what will happen is investors will adjust to that new normal right a, a very aggressive china a very aggressive russia and i think it will probably temper some of the limited partners as we've already kind of seen a little bit it's like a bit of a wait and see but I don't think it's going to have as much of an effect as, let's say, the reduction of the monetary, um, you know, the reduction of the money supply and the increasing of the interest rates will. I think that would actually have a greater effect. But the two together, uh, I do think, well, you're, start, you're going to start seeing a movement out of alternative as a class, right? LPs, like, you know, putting more money into either public markets, real estate, or, or bonds, whatever, just pulling it out of private equity, venture capital, and you know, hedge funds. So I do think you'll start seeing some valuation coming down. You'll start, you'll, you'll, you won't read about the company that raised, you know, this happened just last year, you know, pitched just a seed round at a $10 million valuation in November. And then six months later in like April or May was valued at a hundred million dollars for the series A. And I'm like, I would like to know what they did in six months to be worth that. Right. Because then I want to quit my job and go do that. Right. Um, other than opportunism of the market. Right. Um, and I'm not knocking the funders. Like if you can go get that valuation, go ahead. Like go, I'm, I'm not going to invest, but go, 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 you should the best thing for your company. So I, I do think you'll start to see a, um, just to kind of sum it up and pass the mic over is I think you're going to start to see a softening of LPs. Right now, LPs are just throwing money. I, I hate to use that term, but it truly is happening, right? LPs are just throwing money into this asset class. And then, of course, you know, what's happening? Inflation, right? Like, you know, Joe Biden explained inflation 101 like, like he was a professor at the State of the Union. Well, I do the same thing when it comes to private market valuations. You, you increase the size of total available venture capital by this much and startups only increase in size by this much, you're going to have an inflation of valuation. So I think that's good. That, that's going to start to reverse. And then the Russia Ukraine situation is going to be one of an additional pressure on that. But I actually think it's monetary policy, number one, and then geopolitical, number two. But of course, they're linked, right? I mean, obviously, geop- geopolitics and monetary policy. Right? Yeah. Uh, Kareem, any, any thoughts on that before we close? No, uh, Stephen's covered it a lot. I'll just reiterate what he said at the at the very last comment, which was, you know, if you go, if you've got founders today that are still valuating their companies that they did prior to 2022, 
and haven't realized that there is a meltdown in the public markets and you're still trying to create, raise ex- those kinds of money, that's a 10-foot pool. It's like you are not adjusting to the environment today quickly enough to realize it's changed. Um, so if you're not doing that, please find your money elsewhere because I'm not throwing my money after you. The Ukraine-Russia thing, if, you, if that nuclear power plant is affected or bombed, then there's going to be a serious out, uh, problem with that, I think. Um, but I'm hoping sensible minds prevail and this doesn't go on for too long. It is the Russia-Central Europe issue that's been going on for many, many, many years. It's just become a lot, a lot elevated and vocal now. Hopefully they'll contain it, but I don't think that will have an immediate effect on investable opportunities. I think it's the meltdown currently in the public markets and the valuation of the companies that will have more an effect with the inflationary period um, and the tightening of uh, the resources. That's what I think will, will change things. Right. No, I think uh, these are, uh, I think, very sensible and uh, balanced balanced views. Uh, I said, you know, the other thing that, uh, you know, gives me a little hope is just the structural nature of the European economy and the dependency. You know, the fact is that despite all what's going on, Germany buys half its gas from Russia. Right. Uh, they've canceled Nord Stream 2, but Nord Stream 1 still supplies 52 percent of their the gas and they can't freeze in the winter. They will. So the fact is that, and the Russians can't drink their gas, yes, they can sell it to China, uh, but it's, that's not such an easy you know, transition either. So I think there is you know, long-term economic interest on both sides to, uh, to make things work. Uh, but the, unfortunately, what has happened is that uh, you know, Putin has gone and uh, you know, made it more difficult to reach some kind of understanding uh, you know, with all this humanitarian uh, damage and this, you know, edging on the uh, nuclear option with uh, now this complication of nuclear plant, but also, you know, putting nuclear forces and alert. That is a signaling of the return of the Cold War. That's what I'm worried about, really. That uh, when, you, when, you, when you start that and then you, the Europeans start saying, okay, I'm not spending so much on uh, economic growth. I'm diverting so much to defense. You know, all that changes the, the investment equation a little bit. But you know, again, that's all, uh, you know, to be seen. Uh, so we'll have to watch. And that's what we, you know, reward our management teams to do is to manage this for this uncertainty. So I think uh, it's going to be, you know, uh, a little bit harder to earn their money. But, uh, you know, that's why people go into, go into businesses to manage uncertainty. So. So yeah, thanks. We should tell founders. We should tell founders to ignore the geopolitics the best you can. Uh, that's no longer an option. Uh, no, it's no longer. Uh, yeah, hey, so before we before we sign point. off, I think I sent you both an invite on LinkedIn, or maybe I couldn't get through to Stephen. But we should continue to connect on this. I think there's a lot of synergies that we can have. Oh, absolutely, on. absolutely. And uh, uh, you know, Stephen, uh, just uh, on the on the business side. Uh, you know, we—I uh, I don't know if you're interested in fintechs, but uh, we're—you know—we have about 30 companies in our portfolio in our ventures business in uh, Singapore, and then uh, we have a bunch of them in the Mastercard uh, program as well. Uh, there is an in-house VC capability there as well. So, you know, if you want uh, to, you know, continue the conversation around uh, looking at common companies or. Uh, you know, yeah. reference checks from managers or uh, on uh, founders and the like. Uh, you know, feel free to stay in touch and uh, uh, the same, uh, you know, Karim, you as well. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we will, uh, you know, speak again in more, uh, you know, uh, more relaxed circumstances than what we have today. So uh, hopefully travel resumes again. So, uh, you know, we see each other in person someday. Uh, and. Great. Yeah, and let me just acknowledge for a second my our sole member of the audience, Avi Basu, who is, uh, I don't know if he's still uh, in the room, but uh, Avi, are you there? Do you want to say something? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've given you the mic, Avi. Go ahead. While we're waiting for that, um, 
the guy, uh, Arun, the, the fellow you mentioned who's with you at Standard Chartered in the Bay Area, was that Mike Seagal? Uh, that, uh, you know, I work with the CEO of, uh, uh, of uh, Standard Ventures. His name is Alex Manson. He's based out of Singapore. But he has, I know we have one person in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the Bay Area who is, whom we call the, uh, we call him the bridge to Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. So his his job is to talk to you guys, uh, mm-hmm. and so he's there full time. But I'm happy to connect him. Uh, What's his name? Uh, it'll come to me. I don't have it handy, but I can I can easily find it out. Perfect. That's good. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, I will. Uh, you know, I guess close the session with a really grateful thanks to both of you, and uh, for you know keeping the session. Uh, Interesting and lively, despite the absenteeism we've experienced with other panelists, but that's fine. And uh, look forward to staying in touch. Then, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.